is a confusion between data and code. Almost always, it is, uh, it, it, it is data being misinterpreted as code. I mean, so this is the case for SQL injection, LDAP injection, XPath. It's also the case for cross-site scripting, um, because in cross-site scripting, you have elements being inserted into the DOM, and you know, some, the, those, could, those could be a script element. Which, if it then gets a, if it then gets executed, well, there you go. You've got you've got supposedly data being executed as code. Um, and despite the best efforts of the same origin policy, once an element gets into the DOM, that's it. It's game over. Um, it, if you if you if you've got an element, I mean, JavaScript can be modified on the fly. It's like Lisp. You can you can write self modifying code in JavaScript. I haven't seen a self-modifying XSS exploit, but if any of you write one, I'd love to see it. It would be cool. So Let's start with Dan Kaminsky's uh, self-modifying code that uses the same MD5 hash. He's published that at Black Hat before, so that's a good template for you. Please break stuff for us. So what you want to look for when you are auditing a system to, uh, to find these potential points of weakness is any point where you've got one component emitting a serialization, you know, taking, taking data that's you know, in some binary format and moving it onto the wire or you know, moving it into a text file, just move it, moving it into some, kind of, uh, into some kind of marshalling format for something else to pick up and either use as data or use as code. Um, if it's going to get parsed, there's always, you know, and, it, and if, the, uh, if, the, if the component doing the parsing has the ability to execute things uh, based on what it's parsing, um, this, could, this can be a big problem. So this is another reason why we strongly recommend writing, uh, using the weakest language mechanism you can possibly get away with. You may have seen we've, we've been mentioning HTML5 a lot. I don't want to go on record saying what I'm about to go on record saying because I haven't proved that HTML4 is not Turing complete. It, it's not. We think it's not. We're pretty confident it's not. We haven't sat down and done the proof. But let's just for sake of argument say HTML4 is not Turing complete. HTML5 is. So they've just gone and made a validatable language unvalidatable. You have WebSockets for pulling data. You have browser-side storage that you can use as a tape. Yes, if you have to, God help you, you can actually use the classic you know, 1950s Alan Turing model of, of a paper tape. If you, people have done this in the obfuscated C contest. I'm not kidding. You guys want zero days in HTML5? My intuition says look at the differential between Canvas implementations on one browser versus another. Yeah, you have, you have the ability to pull down data, you have the ability to write it to a tape, and you have JavaScript that will execute it. So that's all you need. Furthermore, HTML5 without JavaScript is still Turing complete. So turning off your JavaScript isn't going to save you this time. Yep. So another pain point that you're going to want to look for is uh, places where, where, where you should just be accepting a, a, a small subset of some language. Um, we'll, we'll get into this uh, more later on in the talk, but uh, the, the, the most common example these days is actually, um, the, is actually the, RESTful, the RESTful APIs um, that you know, in web applications, because all of those, you know, every call is going to be an HTTP call, but only some, but but only a small subset of the entire possible universe of uh, of, of HTTP requests is acceptable. So what you really want to do, on the defense side, is constrain what you're willing to accept. On the attack side, of course, no one does that. So no, yeah, no one actually does that. So on the attack side, what you want to look for is places where you places where you can send something in a very expressive language, 
um, and people are not necessarily going to be expecting things that they didn't predefine. But it's more fun, at least in my opinion, to take two implementations and say, let's you and him fight. So if you have, if you can find an input that produces a certain set of state transitions and a certain output in one implementation, but it does not produce the same set of state transitions or the same output in a different implementation, bad things can happen. The vast majority of TCP IP vulnerabilities actually fall into this category. We're talking about old ones from you know, the 80s, early 90s. That was actually the, uh, they were doing what we ended up formalizing for the X509 uh, attacks, but that's what made us hit on it. I think it was, was Dan Kaminsky who said, wow, this is, this is all, everything old is new again. And uh, sadly, it didn't stop being old. It just stopped being paid attention to. Um, we've been playing whack-a-mole with these sort of problems for uh, 40 years now. Uh, when I give my, when I give my how to write code in a secure fashion so that it doesn't fall victim to these sorts of attacks talk, I basically have to sell the idea that we need to completely redo the way we think about writing software. We need to have a paradigm shift in how we conceive of the art of programming. Well, I don't think that's going to happen by next year or five years from now. Maybe, maybe in a decade, but that's why the, uh, these attacks are going to be here for a while. They're here to stay. So we, when you're going out to look for this, first of all, be overwhelmed by what protocols do I start with? What do I, where do I start here? Um, maybe you're actually an implementer of a certain protocol and you want to make sure that your implementation doesn't fall into these problems, but remember, you've got to audit everybody else's implementations that are supposed to interact with yours because of the composability observation. If you've got code that relies on being a part of a secure system, then you need to actually make sure that all those parts are secure and realize that your security is, again, only as strong as the weakest member of this system. So if you've got a system that has, as a fundamental part of its security model, the requirement that two implementations actually behave identically or interpret the same input in the same way, be it firewall rules or X509 certificates or just simply respecting code and data boundaries on input, SQL, and so forth then that's an area where you're going to want to apply these techniques. Now, Meredith mentioned that you have trouble if your one implementation produces a different parse and output as your second implementation. Well, you don't need to pay attention to the parse at first. If you look at, if you find an instance where one algorithm that's supposed to be identical to a second algorithm produces a different output than the second algorithm when given the same input you know that you've got a difference in your parses. That's the only way you're going to wind up with a different output. So at that point, you back up. You find where that actual linchpin point of difference is. And that will guide and inform your development of an exploit. Now, we're not going to go into the various different types of exploits that you can build for these sorts of things because it is always dependent on what vulnerability you find and what your end goal is, of course. But if you guys are exploit developers, that would probably be stuff you already knew anyway. The point of this talk here is to tell you how to find a, a novel method of finding areas where there are likely to be exploitable weaknesses. In and the methodology for, methodology for doing so. In particular, 
you don't want to you don't you don't want to just look at the code and you don't want to just look at the binaries. You also want to look at the specifications because when a specification is vague, as we said earlier, this means that you will have differences in uh, in how things are implemented in the wild. Don't just look at what the implementation includes. Look at, or, or sorry, at what the, spe at what the spe specification includes. Look at what it leaves out. In X509, for instance, we had the problem of, well, first of all, there is no X509 implementation that actually makes use of multiple values for common name, to my knowledge. Anybody knows different? Please tell me. Fourth talk, I've said that and gotten no hands. But the spec allows multiple values for CN. However, both the ITU and there's actually one RFC written, you know, the IETF RFCs that has guidance for how to handle multiple CNs, multiple values for a CN. And I believe it's something, I wish I had the quote, but it's something about as useless as use the one that makes the most sense. So is that the first one? Is that the last one? Is that the middle one? Is that the one that's evenly divisible by 17? Roll know. the dice. And of course, this led to one of our attacks in the X509 because you've got different implementations in looking at the one that makes the most sense differently. One browser takes the first one, one browser takes the last one, one browser tosses a coin, and you wind up with you submit to your submit your CSR to your uh, your certificate authority, and it picks the first one, and that happens, and you know it's going to pick the first one, so you put your your innocuous, legitimate common name in there, and then you target everybody that's using, I think Mozilla was the one taking the last one. So yeah. you target them with that. And then you do the reverse when you want to find, uh, when you want to attack people running IE. Uh, All right, uh, another question. That's still a form of serialization. I mean, I, I'm, 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 using, I'm using that term just to mean data, the, you know, data that was in memory gets, you know, gets written to something that we can send it to other people with. Okay. Yeah, it's the ser serialization is just you know, the process of getting it from, you know, in, the, in, in the human language model, it's from your head into the air. Into a sentence. <laughs> I liked um, that one. They thought they scrubbed it, but they didn't do a good job and then left stuff through to put it in the right Well, that, that's the problem is you can think you've put in place protections against injection using regexes. And you can catch, you know, mo you can make it a pain in the ass to do an injection attack. If your language is context free and you're using a regular expression whitelisting or blacklisting approach, but you simply cannot, you can't make proof that says that's going to, uh, to ensure that we've parsed this correctly because you're the actual interpreter that's going to generate, you know, to, to make use of the code that you're, or the input that you're trying to sanitize is computationally stronger than the, uh, the, the blacklist, whitelist filter yeah, the checker. Well, really, the right way to do, the the right way to do it is actually context-free whitelisting, yeah. um, which is to say, co come up with a, a restricted sub-language of uh, well, in, in this case, we'll say HTML that only includes generation rules for what you're willing to accept. So, for instance, um, you would disallow any production that contains the script tag. Um, if you you can actually you, you can actually view yeah, you, you can actually view not just a parse tree, but a language as a tree. Um, if anybody's ever taken a look at a bison file uh, or, or a yak input file, um, you've got essentially this hierarchical list of, uh, of production rules. And if you, if, you, if you remove production rules that produce symbols that you, do, that, that you don't want, 
then you can you can keep those